Hey everyone, welcome to Midweek. We're so happy that you decided to join us this evening. My name is Alante Allen. And we want to encourage you guys that as we're getting ready to get in the word and get ready for worship, we actually ask you guys to just get involved. If you guys want to sing, shout, we encourage you to do so. If you have the Bible app or the actual Bible, we follow along that way as well. We want you guys to feel like you're actually there with us. You know, so with that being said, let's get ready for worship and see you guys soon. Peace. Nothing is better than you 
So there's a line in that song that says, I'm not afraid to show you my weaknesses, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all and you still call me friend. Here's the beauty of that. Like sometimes I think we try so hard to convince people that we good and we try to cover up those things, but there's really nothing that we're dealing with no feeling, no emotion, no thought, no weakness, no failure that God is not aware of. In fact, he's keenly aware of it. And even in the midst of that, he still wants us. He still wants to draw near to us. He still wants to connect with us. I, I, I like that based on what I'm going to, to, to share with you this evening. Um, um, here's the thing about this. Um, I never give a talk to you Oftentimes, the things that you hear me say, I'm really saying to myself, is something that God has shown me about me, shared with me. And you're basically hearing a conversation that I have to have with myself in order to get myself together, in order to realign my thoughts. And, and I'm going to try to be as vulnerable as possible with you. Um, this is a talk uh, that I gave a few months back. I walked through this scripture with some of our youth and a student reached out to me uh, about six weeks ago and asked me if I would do this talk again. And I kind of put it to the side, but it was brought back to me. And the reason it was brought back to me is God had to have a talk with me. And hopefully you'll understand as I keep going. But I'm reading from a passage in Scripture, Matthew 15, starting in verse 21. And it reads this way. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep the people of Israel. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord. But even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. God, I come to you right now. Guard my heart, guard my tongue, guard my thoughts. You lead, I follow. You say what needs to be said. You do what needs to be done. Holy Spirit, I am relying totally on you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Um, so there's a thing that is often said. They say you should never meet your heroes. Um, And for me, I always find that interesting because it makes me think of a story involving a friend of mine and myself when we were much younger. So we lived in Birmingham, Alabama, and we don't have a professional NBA team. And so what the NBA squads would do during the preseason is they would travel around to cities that don't have a team and they would play their preseason games in their city. Now, during this time, Michael Jordan has just come back to the league. So Michael Jordan is a big deal. And the Chicago Bulls is one of the teams that came 
And there was this other team. Now, I'm not going to call the team's name because I don't want to embarrass the player, but you'll kind of guess where this story is going. But I have a bunch of friends who are huge fans of a player for this other team. So they come to town. His dad takes me, him, and some client. He was trying to, you know, smooth, you know, show him a good time. He takes us to the game. And at the end of the game, we go across the street to the Sheraton Hotel, which is the only five-star hotel in Birmingham at the time. So we know as we go to this hotel and we're going to have dinner at this steakhouse that nine times out of ten, if the basketball players want dinner, they'll be standing at that hotel and they'll probably come in the restaurant. And so my friend has a poster of this basketball player, and he's just hoping that this player comes in. So we sit there, and I'm really hoping Michael Jordan come, but Michael Jordan never showed up. Oh, well, never, nothing here. Anyway, we're sitting there, and about halfway through the meal, you know, his dad is doing the business and saying what his, his firm can do for him. And in walks this basketball player. And my friend takes off running with his poster and his Sharpie, and he runs right to him. And the basketball player goes like this and walks off. Well, my friend comes back, and he is ticked. He's upset. He doesn't want the rest of his burger. He's not eating. He don't want nothing. He just wants to go home. We go home that evening. It was a Wednesday, and he immediately goes in, and he starts ripping posters off his wall. He pulls other basketball jerseys out of his closet. He's like, I'm going to throw them in the trash. And his mom like, boy, no, you're not. He was like, well, I'm not going to wear his shoes. I'm not going to do this. Even the next day when we went to school on Thursday, everybody was like, how was the game? And we're like, we saw Michael Jordan play because he only played in the first quarter. And my friend, Gerald, didn't want to say anything about his basketball player. Everything had changed. He met him. He was disappointed wants nothing to do with him. Fast forward, almost 20 years later, my friend lives in Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta for an NBA event, and I call him. I say, hey, guess what? Why don't you bring your boys, your two sons, come meet me. There's a whole bunch of basketball players, you know, retired guys, but they're down here. They're chopping it up. They're signing autographs. Good time. And I start naming players that are there, and I name this one player, and he goes, man, forget him. Don't you remember what happened when I met him that time? Trey, we were like 12 years old, and he starts retelling the whole story as if I wasn't there. And he was like, bump him. I don't care if he was on fire, I'd probably stand there and applaud. Now, at some point, I'm like, dude, you need to let this go. But the pain of his first encounter with this player has haunted him for years. Even now, I know he's watching, and he's probably going to be upset. He'll probably start retelling the story to his wife about what happened on that night. Now, now here's the thing that I realized, that we had seen this guy. We had known him through television. We had actually seen him um, on a sitcom, and he was there helping this other person who was getting bullied in school. He came and saved the day for the underdog. So that's how we interpreted him. That's what we thought of him. Most of our heroes, we think of them as being good people from the movies we see them playing in or the way we see them carry themselves in the media. We assume that if I encounter them, they're going to be just as nice. But then every now and again, we meet that person, and it's a letdown. This is nothing new, though. This is something that I've come to experience, not just with celebrities, but if I'm being honest, if I'm being truthful to you, that sometimes my faith and my connection with God has felt that way. See, I've, I've heard the stories of what God has done in other people's life and how they prayed a prayer and God came through and it was so great and Jesus loves you and all that type of stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's what you experienced? Okay, cool. And I go and I'm like, it wasn't like that for me. I, I, didn't, I didn't have that same response. What's wrong? Here's why I'm reading this story right here. The story says there was a woman, a Gentile woman who lived in this area and Jesus was there. Her daughter is sick and she goes and she says, hey, Jesus, uh, can can, can you 
help me. Can you help me? Now, here's the thing. By this point, the, the name of Jesus and, and who he is and what he's able to do is begin to spread. If I was like, oh, man, Jesus, this dude, he can heal people. He lay hands on the sick and they get well. Oh, this dude, Jesus, even the lady's like, oh, he's such a sweetheart. You meet that Jesus. He's so nice. Jesus is this guy. She's like, oh, yeah, I heard about him. All right. You had a good thing with Jesus. Cool. I'm going to go. I'm going to see Jesus and he can help me. And that's not what happened. It says that she gets there and she cries out to Jesus and it says Jesus ignored her. Now, listen, I know some of you pretty well. Let's 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 take the religious part off. Let's just talk about people in general. Y'all ready to cuss somebody out if they don't speak to you. So they don't know Jesus, the son of God raised from the dead. They just know Jesus, the nice guy. And this nice guy ain't speaking. And she goes, Jesus, I need your help. And he ignores her. I have to be honest, I've I felt like that, like I'm crying out to Jesus and this dude act like he don't hear me. Uh, Jesus, don't you, you see what I'm going through? Don't you see the prayer I'm trying to pray for my family member? Jesus, come on, man, don't, don't you hear me? And it says, he ain't say nothing. To make matters worse is Jesus is ignoring her. It says the disciples like, get rid of her. Her begging is bothering us. Send her away. So now I got a crowd of people who treat me less than. Now I'm in the middle of, of seeking Jesus, and now I got a bunch of spectators who don't even want me there. And this dude's ignoring me. I guess, is it okay for me to be honest that I've, I've found myself praying and, and I'm like, Jesus, you know what I'm going through. Jesus, you see me on these stages and I'm preaching your word. I'm working for you, but I'm still praying and I'm telling these people to believe, but you're making it hard for me to believe. Won't you come through? Why are you ignoring me? Don't you? Why are you silent? What's, what's going on? Scripture says, Jesus says nothing. And his disciples, his followers are saying, get rid of her. But here's where it gets interesting. See, this is what I believe was happening because I read the whole text so we know how the text ends. The problem is some of us get lost in the middle part between our prayer and the payoff. And it's that part in the middle that looks a little crazy, that looks a little uncertain. But let me point out the disciples here. The disciples say, get rid of her. And after they say, get rid of her, it says she kept going to Jesus. Jesus, help, help, help. Jesus, help. And then it says that Jesus responded this time with basically what I have ain't for you. And she kept responding to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, help. But what I find interesting is the silence of the disciples during all of this. You're like, well, what? Yeah, remember Jesus, if you heard me, he's going to say, why give what I have that's for the children to the dogs? Yo, Jesus, chill. Did you just call this woman a dog, my Lord and Savior? Let me show you something here, though. If you go back to the beginning of Matthew 15, you'll see that when Jesus enters this town at the beginning, that some Pharisees, they come to Jesus and they complain about the disciples. And here's what they complain about, which I find ironic in this current climate. Um, they complained that the disciples weren't washing their hands before they eat. Like, they were like, uh, your disciples don't wash their hands. They gross. And so as you look in it, if your Bible is, you know, everybody else is in black and when Jesus talks, it's red. There's like three lines of black and then it's like 20 lines of red. So Jesus goes off. Jesus tell these Pharisees who are coming against the disciples, man, your worship is fake. You ain't nothing. I mean, Jesus talks about them. He goes hard. And he used scripture against them. And he coming at them. And here's where it gets interesting because the disciples hear Jesus come against these rich, powerful Pharisees. And they be like, Jesus, calm down. You may offend them. Don't say nothing to hurt their feelings. But Jesus called this woman a dog and they ain't say nothing. It's almost like she deserves it. 
See, I don't know about you. I, I had a problem with that. I, I, I'm like, come on now, Jesus, you close to the brokenhearted, you close to the low people, you do all these things, and, and you say these things matter, and your disciples who are supposed to be your followers have this opportunity to stand up for this poor lowly woman, and they don't say nothing. But they care so much what the rich and powerful say. See, at this point, they've taken the focus off of loving people and loving positions. And if I'm honest, sometimes I do the same thing. See, I feel like certain people in positions should get certain answers. And so God should meet their needs and God should take care of them because of their positions. But what about those people who don't have the position of power, the voiceless? Maybe that's who Jesus is really close to. Do you know why I do that sometimes, though? It's because I find it easier to assume that if he takes care of the people who are right and the righteous and the good people, then maybe that, can, that would include me. Hey, Jesus, don't you need to take care of me? Jesus, don't offend me. Jesus, don't leave me hanging. Jesus, I, I've earned it. Jesus, I'm preaching. Jesus, I'm doing the stuff for you. Jesus, I'm, I'm living them for you. I'm working for you. And so if I'm working for you, it's only right that you should probably work for me. When it doesn't happen, I find myself not just pulling away. I can do the religious stuff, but I become distant and, and not as, as into Jesus. Oh, I'll come to church. I'll even sit in your service. I'll do what you want. But I'm not coming and asking you for nothing because the last time I came for you, you let me down. My prayer life ain't the same. Yeah, I'll say an our, our Father just to get through a service, but I'm not coming to you because when I came to you the last time, you let me down. See, I've heard about your goodness from all these other people, but that's not what I experienced, so therefore I can't do it. But let me hold on here. Let me show you something. This woman, I believe her pain positioned her for a purpose. That Jesus is saying to this woman, okay, I'm going to make you an example, not just to my disciples, but for all mankind for the rest of history. Scripture, let me take you back. Jesus ignores her, and she keeps talking. Jesus says, it's not for you, and she keeps talking. One of the commandments that we have is Jesus says, when you ask, keep asking, and keep asking, and keep asking. So, so Jesus says to this woman, no, and she keeps asking. Not only that, when Jesus says, what I have is not for you, it says that she began to worship. Wait. We only want to worship when we get what we want. But when she got rejected, it caused her to worship him. Look at it. It's sitting there. See, she didn't respond to his response. She responded to who he is. See, Jesus is worthy whether he does what we want or not. But here's where it gets very good. Jesus says, why should I give was for the children to the dogs. And a lot of church people, if I let you in, they don't want to talk about this text. I've heard some people say, well, Jesus didn't call her a junkyard dog. He meant like a dog, like a puppy in the house. Who cares, stupid? He still says she was a dog. I don't know about you, but me and Jesus be ready to fight. And that's not what this woman did. She responded in a manner, and Jesus says, by the way you responded, you're a woman of great faith. Not how you reacted. Not how you got ticked. Not how you got mad. But how you responded, not to my response, but to me, makes you a person of faith. See, I'm guilty of responding in anger. I'm guilty of going through this life where I'm like, okay, God, you let me down. Can I be honest? Yeah, I felt that way. But faith requires me to respond a little bit differently. See, here's the thing. We all say we want to be used by God. And I believe that Jesus took this moment to use this woman to be an example because she got her breakthrough, but a way to handle how we deal with these difficult times. But everybody who wants to be used by God, prepare to feel used. 
by God. See what he used with this woman's pain. Her daughter gets healed. But she had to embarrass herself a little bit. She had to humble herself a little bit. She had to worship when she didn't hear what she wanted. See, we all want God to do something for us, but are we really, really willing to do what it takes? Because while we say we want to be used by God, it don't work the other way because some of us are guilty of trying to use God. And what God is saying is that I have a greater purpose in humanity. But your offense and your feelings cannot keep you from connection. I believe it's something beautiful when we can say, God, you let me down. God, you hurt me. God, I don't know where you are. I think that's okay, but we can't stay there. Because even when God says no, we respond with, God, you're still good. God, you know my failures, you know my flaws, you know my pains, you know my strains, but God, you're still good. And even in this moment where my anger makes it difficult to love and my anger makes it hard to forgive and my anger makes it hard to trust and my indecisions are there sitting in the forefront. And I'm like, God, what do I do? And I don't feel like you're talking. God says, keep talking. He says, keep asking. The lady asked three times. But if she don't ask three, her daughter doesn't get healed. So I'm saying to you, that that breakthrough, you got to keep asking. Don't get caught up in where you find yourself. Don't get caught up in the circumstance that blinds you, that you don't see his glory and you don't keep going after him and you don't keep going. When everybody around you is saying, shut up, you're getting on his nerves. Jesus says, what aggravates mankind, that's what I require. I have kids and one of the things I can't stand is if I close the door, why you keep knocking? I say, leave me alone. But God says, if you stand at the door, keep knocking. Keep asking. Yeah, it's frustrating. But keep knocking. Keep asking. He don't hear me? Yeah, he hear you, but keep knocking. Keep asking. Because that's what's required. And even if you feel a little bit foolish, it seems a little bit of a waste of time. The consistent connection with Jesus is what's going to get us through. Truth of the matter is, he's not going to answer every prayer the way you or I want. And that hurts me to say. Because there's a lot that I'm praying for. There's a lot that I'm believing for. There's a lot that may even sometimes, if I'm honest, keep me up at night. But just because I'm in a tough position doesn't mean that God's not working. And even if he says no, I'm still required to worship him. Love him. Trust him. And I can't allow my offense to cause me to cut off relationship. Listen, God expects a lot of us. It's all or nothing. And we cannot allow ourselves to become distant or lukewarm towards God. We either hot or we cold. Scripture says if you're not, he spits you out. But what he seeks is a connection with him, not just with his stuff not just with his answers. Don't be so concerned with the hand of God that you never seek the heart of God. Even right now, it's not something you grow into, but maturity can start right now. It's required right now. Because it's right now, if you do what God has called you to do in the way he's called you to do, that you can experience his peace. I don't care how old, how young you are, where you find yourself on that scale. We all need the peace of God. It's that peace that's going to get us through. It's that peace that gives us strength. It's that peace that makes us purposeful, not just for ourselves, but for those around us. Look, I love you. You're valuable. I care about you. Jesus cares about you. We as a church body care about you. We're praying for you. We can't wait to the time that we all can get back together. But even in this moment where we're scattered together, let's continue to grow. Let's continue to love. Let's continue to be the people God has called us to be. Till next time, I'm out. Elbows up. See ya.
been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled and won't surrender. Just my heart adrift and drifted home again. Hundred blessings till I've been desperate to find.
peace and